From the first day of training camp, there seemed to be less tension present than in years past. The atmosphere was peaceful. New head coach Jack Pardee's vocation was not in taunting his players, but teaching them. I think it's a lot more relaxed. It's a lot more business-like, and you, you see a lot more learning going on. Uh, it's not a lot of standing around. There's a whole lot of things going on in a lot of different places. <laughs> Emphasis was placed on fundamentals. With Pardee, the defense was taught the ABCs of the 4-3, while the offense learned the three R's, reading schemes, receivers' roots, go hum, 35, crap, and the run and shoot. But the transition from practice field to playing field did not go, go smoothly at first. Blue 70! Check me. Blue 70! Son! Time. It takes a while to get it down. There's much reading going on. The players really have to be thinking. And if not, it looks, it, it looks pretty ugly if they're not doing it right. And once we get on track, we're going to be very explosive and we're going to be uh, a team that everybody's going to fear, I think. With the NFL's deadliest passer and the league's deepest receiving core, Houston fashioned a daring and dangerous attack. But the Oilers were not just a team of the pass. They fielded the AFC's second-ranked rushing defense. Games were hard fought, and victory became a battle of wills. The entire season came down to the wire, and in the end, the Houston Oilers earned their fourth consecutive playoff berth and displayed a license to thrill. When the season started, the Oilers were still trying to decipher the run and shoots operating manual, and it showed. Falcon showing blitz. Boom, gonna run the option play. Can't get around the corner. Drag down. Was it Tuggle? Yes, it was Jesse Tuggle who made the stop. Oh, they're gonna say this ball is live again. Tuggle's gonna take it in. Is they gonna call this another touchdown? I don't believe it. This is absolutely incredible. The following week in Pittsburgh, Houston's defense limited the Steeler offense to their lowest yardage output in 11 years. But victory still slipped away. Three-step drop for Gibbons behind the ball. The Oilers were winless after two games and needed to find a way to tune up their sputtering offense. White stays in the backfield and move will go off under center. Has plenty of time. Gets a snap away. Blitz coming. Dump the ball off for White at the 15. Lorenzo White gave Houston its first lead of the year, and he helped Warren Moon eclipse the team record for career passing yardage. Down to 50 seconds as Moon goes into the shotgun. Looking in the end zone, drops the ball off for White. He's at the five. He's at the three. While Moon to White provided the margin of victory, Let's go, the winning edge came from another source. The Euler defense produced four turnovers and over the course of the game knocked all three Colt quarterbacks out with injuries. Houston finally had win number one. The following week in San Diego, the defensive line of William Fuller, Ray Childress, Doug Smith, and Sean Jones, number 96, continued to apply the pressure to make sure the Oilers never trailed. Tolliver is going to throw. Moves out of the pocket, throws over the middle, ball intercepted, and it's Dishman. He's got it at the 41 yard line, and now they're penalty. Three Charger mistakes set up scoring opportunities for Houston. And for the third time of the young season, the offensive line of Mike Munchak, Bruce Matthews, Don Maggs, David Williams, Doug Dawson, Jay Pennison, and Dean Steincooler provided the protection that helped Moon pass the 300-yard barrier.
The Oilers had been a team on the tightrope, but they refused to fall over the edge. And after four weeks, even their record to two and two. Listen up, listen to me. We're gonna go special. Great legal hits. We don't chase any from the back. We want our offense to start in great field position. Ball security, we knock the living. Here we go. Knock out on the set. Set, knock out! Against the defending world champion 49ers, the Oilers played like a team possessed. And yes, they did get a knockout. Houston dominated the entire first half, and the Astrodome was transformed into a good old-fashioned hoedown. The Oilers seemed determined to stomp out San Francisco's winning ways, and Moon's receivers trampled the 49er secondary with perfectly timed roots. Deep down the middle, hands of Andrew Hill, Short roll to the left, throwing over the middle for Jeffrey. Got it down. He went Jeffries. For three and a half quarters, the Oilers were in command. But unfortunately, there was someone in attendance who was regarded as commander in chief when it comes to fourth quarter comebacks. Montana to pass, third and four over the middle, has a man. And then wow. a Taylor, he breaks free at the 40, at the 30, at the 20. He's going to score. Touchdown, San Francisco. Oh. While some dreamed about what could have been, others realized Houston had a talented team, and it would be only a matter of time until Lady Luck smiled upon the Oilers. In 1990, a fresh group of faces served as assistant coaches. Pat Thomas, Steve Watterson, Bob Young, Jim Stanley, Chris Palmer, Frank Novak and Richard Smith all stressed fundamentals and helped define each person's responsibility. Keep outside leverage, okay? Right. If the end blocks you, the ball's going away from you. Place kicker Teddy Garcia joined the Oilers for their last 10 games of the season. Punter Greg Montgomery broke a 25-year-old team record by averaging an NFL best 45 yards per punt. However, Montgomery didn't punt often enough to qualify for the league minimum. First-year defensive coordinator Jim Eddy was needed to restore Houston's defense into working condition. Contain, be very contained, conscious. Huh? In 1990, Houston's defense played within the rules and channeled their aggression into hard hits and big plays. The Air Patrol of Terry Kennard, Chris Dishman, Patrick Allen, Bubba McDowell, and Richard Johnson, number 23, secured the secondary, which allowed Houston's front seven to attack at the source. The Oilers' 4-3 defense featured a scheme that blitz linebackers. Here, Al Smith fills in the hole. In the Oilers' new scheme, everybody had a turn. In week six, Houston repeatedly blitzed, disrupting the passing game to cause four turnovers in a rout over the Bengals. Over back the pass. Throws it out on the far side. Yay! Ball is tipped off a hold of hands. Intercepted. This is Richard Johnson at the 20, at the 10, at the 5, yeah. and it's score. Yeah. The following week, Johnny Meads, number 91, earned NFL Player of the Week honors as his well-timed hits forced three fumbles in a victory against the Saints. Meads finished the game of his career with his first ever pass interception. In 1990, Houston's defense improved in nearly every statistical category. But just when the Oilers finally seemed to gel together, the bugaboo of inconsistency reappeared. After nine weeks, Houston's chances for a division title dimmed. But the four or five Oilers would emerge from the shadows following their idle week off 
to build some momentum towards a second season surge. And they did it by returning to the foundation of their attack. Moon stepped into a pocket formed by blockers that seemed to never allow a defender inside its wall of protection. Throw it deep down the sideline for Jeffries at the five touchdown. Yeah. There it is. Moon will go back to pass. Three Get steps, throwing here. it for right Tony here. Jones. Get touchdown. Right. <laughs> Brown showing blitz. They're bringing seven. Moon's there. The pass off for Duncan at the 20. With five touchdown passes to five different receivers, the Oilers cruise past Cleveland. Let me get in the rhythm. Let me get in the rhythm, all right? He's throwing on rhythm. We're getting a pass rush. But even with his back covered, at times, Moon still shot blanks. Drops back five steps, sets up, throwing deep down the middle for Jeffries. At the oh, he can't read it at the 10-yard line. Houston's complex system was stymied by overlooking one simple rule. Eyes on the ball. Gilbride set his receivers straight, and soon their names became a constant at the top of the receiving charts. They were nicknamed the Fab Four, and their pictures were plastered everywhere. Houston's huddle contained more stars than there are in the heavens. The Fab Four made it a hard day's night for any secondary. Haywood Jeffries led the conference with 74 catches and 1,048 yards, shattering his previous highs. Career bests in receptions and receiving yardage were also established by Curtis Duncan. Drew Hill matched Jeffries' 74 catches, and for the fourth time in his career, Hill broke the 1,000-yard barrier. Ernest Gibbons set a personal milestone with 72 catches and nine touchdowns. With these record-setting receivers, Houston started down the long and winding road to the playoffs. No artist survives long in the limelight without a strong supporting cast. At 5'6 and 139 pounds, Tony Jones is the NFL's smallest man. But with a 4.240, he's also the swiftest and quickly demonstrated he was capable of scorching defenses. Jones caught six of Moon's 33 touchdown passes and joined with Gerald McNeil and Leonard Harris, number 83, to give the Oilers a trio of talented reserve receivers. The dynamic skills of Houston's wideouts fit football's offense of the future like a pair of snug receiver's gloves. The run and shoot employs four receivers that stretch the defense. One receiver occupies the underneath coverage. This gives the passer an unobstructed path to another receiver in the same zone. It's an offense that overloads a defense and is able to get a receiver so far wide open, there seems to have been a blown assignment in the secondary. If the defense blitzes, the quarterback finds the one-on-one -on -one coverage and throws the ball where it cannot be intercepted. When the Oilers 
Americans are at their best, they come at you from too many angles to defend. Hum 80 Z Go is Houston's equivalent to basketball's pick and roll. Defenses knew it was coming, but couldn't stop it. The run and shoot, the most lethal offense in the game today. Just like Coach said, we get a second chance. Not too many teams to get a second chance. Here we are, same place as last year. Remember last year. Let's get it done today. A win on three. One, two, three. Win! Houston tried to avenge last year's 61-7 loss to Cincinnati. And guided by Moon, the Oilers led for most of the game. However, every completed pass made him a more desirable target. You know that defense is gearing to stop you, and, and all of a sudden, wham, somebody lays a helmet on you and kind of knocks you into oblivion. You're in your follow-through motion, and those are the ones that people really never see because once the ball leaves your hand, then they follow it down the football field. Just when the Oilers had the division title within their crosshairs, Moon was caught in the crossfire. Houston's postseason fate was held by a backup quarterback against a familiar foe. It always comes down to Pittsburgh, don't it? <laughs> always comes down to Pittsburgh. For both teams, the situation was cut and dry. Win the game, and you're in the playoffs. Lose, and the season's over. All right, Cody, you can do it! Come on, Cody. You'd never know Cody was making his first start, would you? No, no, he don't. He acts like a veteran. He has got that confidence that a quarterback must have. He exudes it out there. He knows, and he lets his players know in the huddle who is the man in charge. I knew if he'd come out here his first two passes, everything would work out for him, and he did. Against the NFL's top-ranked pass defense, Cody Carlson completed 75% of his throws. With time, now he's going to run. At the 15, he throws, and he ends up cutting. All year, the Steeler defense had allowed only six scoring passes. Carlson equaled half of that amount in only three quarters and became forever known as Commander Cody. You couldn't ask for a guy to step into this situation, a must-game win for us to get in the playoffs. Hadn't really played all year long. And, and step in and play the way he did. I mean, he didn't just play good, he played great. Carlson, short roll left, sets up with time. Throwing it deep down the middle for Jeffries at the 15-10, five touchdown! Hey, boy, Jeffries gets by Ron Woodson for the... Cody, uh, he's always been able to do the job. Hey, I guess uh, the critics know uh, what type of backup he is. The critics also discovered another strength the Oilers can call on. Richard Johnson picked off his AFC leading eighth interception as the defense set the tempo of the game. Morley with the run over right tackle gets up to the 35. Ball pops loose. The Oilers say they have it. Lamar Wayland with a big, big hit. In his first start of the season, Lamar Latham produced the game's first turnover and finished off the Steelers. We did what we had to do. We took the game. Now we're in the playoffs. So now we just got to keep going. That's it, all right? Perhaps the greatest display of guts was shown by the Oilers' offensive line. They adjusted to the switch that moved all pro guard Bruce Matthews to center for the game. Matthews secured the line by bagging two for the price of one on running plays and kept the pocket safe by sticking with defenders on intricate stunts. With Matthews at center, Houston was heading in the right direction, and the Oilers followed his lead to completely dominate the league's number one rated defense. Pardee designed a game plan that was executed to perfection. Hey, congratulations. Did what, it, what we had to do tonight, everybody playing as hard as they could, keeping their poise, and not being denied. 
I told them, I said that everything was in your hands tonight, see. <laughs> I bet they were nervous. There was a bunch of them coming over there tonight. Well, you know, Jack just brings that stability that we need in the organization. You know, we're all dedicated to success, and Jack's a very integral part of that. We've had a lot of peaks and valleys, and, and uh, what he demands more than anything is just trying to be consistent, and that's what the good teams do week in and week out. Everyone counted them out. The Oilers never called it quits. In 1990, the Oilers were the only AFC team to qualify for the postseason for the fourth straight year. In 1991, they will be back. To pick up where they left off. Flashing their license to thrill.